I think there's so much potential out there to share with the world, which is our target market, right? Everybody out there, we want to do more work. We want to work for them. And I think there's huge opportunity in that. I mean, there's, it's fairly untapped. Business of Architecture, episode 177. Hello, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I'd like to invite you to discover how to double your architecture firm income and create your dream practice of freedom and impact by downloading my free four-part architecture firm profit map. As a podcast listener, you can get instant access by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today, we talk with the modern-day Renaissance man and architect Evan Troxel. Evan is one of the hosts of the popular ArchiSpeak podcast, and he works for HMC Architects based out of Southern California. As you'll discover... In this interview, he actually has quite a few things going on, all of which are extremely fascinating and interesting. I think you'll be inspired by Evan's drive, his passion for life, and his passion for sharing. Today, you'll also get a behind-the-scenes look at podcasting for architects. So without further ado, here's today's show. Evan Troxel, welcome to Business of Architecture. Thanks. Thanks, Dina, for having me. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be on the Business of Architecture podcast. Fantastic. So just behind the scenes, I just recorded maybe 15 minutes with Evan and that, well, I didn't record it actually. We were, we thought we were recording. We weren't. So that beautiful nuggets of information, I'm sorry, is lost to all posterity. False. Yeah. False start. Oh, I know. Well. But here's round two. So Evan, just let our listeners know if they don't know who you are, let us know a little bit of back about you and your background. All right. So my name is Evan Troxel. I am an architect and I practice in Southern California at HMC Architects is my day job. And we do uh, public work. So schools, healthcare, um, university stuff, civic work. And uh, besides that, I am a co-host of Arca Speak podcast, which some of your listeners may know of. And uh, it is a podcast that goes behind the scenes in all things architecture, the good and the bad. And I co-host that with Neil Pan and Cormac Phelan. And Enoch, you and I have known each other for a few years now. And uh, because of the podcast, I think I've, I've been on your podcast once before. And uh, it's, it's just opened up a lot of opportunities out there. So I'm, I'm really happy to have done that and to have met you and to have this opportunity to be here today. And I've got a few other projects that I do too. I've got a, a website where I share digital training and 3D programs for architects called getmethod.com. And I just wrote a book called ARE Hacks, which I hope we could talk about a little bit today. Absolutely. And we're definitely going to get to that. Let's talk a little bit about, let's start talking about by podcasting because you and I were just discussing how uh, you, I think you were spearheaded the application to the AIE, right? That's right. So we submitted a proposal for talking at the AIA convention, which is coming up in Orlando next year. And uh, we got passed on to round two, which is cool because uh, that means we get to provide a little bit more info and hopefully get our talk um, accepted for next year. And so what we decided we wanted to do was share what it's like to create and make a podcast and put it out there. So kind of behind the scenes of your podcast, my podcast, and the Entree Architect podcast. And uh, just let people know, like, how to do it, what it's like, um, how much work is it, um, what kind of stories can you tell, um, what kind of opportunities does it open up. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of great, rich information in there that architects could really use to bolster their business and help give themselves a platform to give back to the profession, but also create any audience you want. Like one thing that's interesting about our podcast is we are focused on people in the profession, but I don't think it needs to stop there. I think uh, it would be cool to hear what other people want to do, you know, reaching new clients. It's a great way to reach potential clients. I think uh, there's lots of stories to be told about what it's like working with an architect. What's it like working with you on a project? What are the success stories that you've had with clients? So there's all kinds of things we could explore. I mean, one of our angles is that we want the the audience to kind of drive the direction of what they want to find out about podcasting. So hopefully it gets accepted. I mean, we're, we got our fingers crossed. And here's the deal is that this, this, uh, you know, 
application that Evan has put in there, you know, obviously it'll be fun to be up there for us, but to be able to share this information with you all and with the architects who attend the convention, you know, there are architects right now who are reviewing this application and they probably don't know maybe a whole lot about podcasts, definitely not anything about us, unless we're really lucky. Um, So here's what you can do as listeners. It would be fantastic if you tweet to at A-I-A-C-O-N-V, as in Victor, that's short for AI convention, and just tell them, man, we want to hear you know, we want to hear business of architects. We want to hear entree architect and we want to hear Archie speak at the AI convention, you know, because if they hear there's interest, then that, that might, that might have a little it, bit of sway, you know, it can't hurt, right? It yeah. can't hurt at all. You know, tweet to <laughs> AI national and just let them know, bring them to the convention, uh, because yep. we want to be famous and you guys want to hear the inside story and it's, it's just a win-win. So tongue in cheek about, yep. we want to be famous, but <laughs> so Evan, I know before you started a podcast um, that you were a listener of podcasts. So how did your perspective change from going from a listener to actually a producer of podcasts? Tell us about that. I don't I don't know that my perspective has changed a lot other than you you figure out how much work it is. Um, and, and our podcast is because it's three people and we have a pretty high standard for audio quality and... Um, show notes and what we put out, it it can be a lot of work. So my perspective in that is when I listen to podcasts now, I mean, there's some out there that blow ours away. I'm not saying that we compete at the highest level. I mean, if if any any of your listeners know of 99% Invisible or Radio Lab or those types of podcasts are another level of of quality and editing. Those are fully produced shows. And I, you know, those are someone's full-time job. So as a podcast that is done after hours, I mean, uh, Cormac is on the East Coast. Neil and I are on the West Coast. So when we record uh, one night during the week, I mean, it is into the wee hours of the morning for Cormac. And so just aligning those schedules and getting that all to happen, um, it's not the easiest thing to do. I mean, I've got four kids. Neil's got two kids. Cormac has three kids. How do you make it all work? How do you balance all that? And it gives me an appreciation for what people are able to do so consistently week to week. I mean, ours is every two weeks. I would love to be able to do it more than that. But with the sheer amount of work that it is, it's not possible. And we've kind of settled into that. And I think it works for us. Um, But podcasts like yours, like Mark LePage's, uh, you know, every single week, it, it becomes a thing that you have to do and that you have to deliver on if you've kind of set up that expectation. So I have a total appreciation for that. I've gotten way more into podcasts because of I have a podcast of my own. So I'm always listening for new ways to do things. Um, you know, we're sponsored podcasts. So how are ad reads done? Um, how, how do we work stuff into our show? What topics are out there that are important to talk about? We're always kind of rethinking and retooling and reworking all that kind of stuff as we go along. It's, it's a work in progress. I mean, if you go back to episode number one and compare it to the 99th episode, which is going up this Sunday night, it's a huge jump in audio quality, but that was a gradual change over all that time. So there's a lot of, a lot of like, it's just been a, an evolution, right? And I, I think that's probably the best way to describe it. And it's been a learning experience and it's opened up amazing opportunities along the way. What kind of opportunities have you seen from it? So Arcaspeak, because we've been doing, like I said, we're, we're at, a, at almost, we've actually recorded through our 100th episode. Uh, and we so that'll be going up, you know, in a couple of weeks after the 99th. Um, that's been four years worth of work for us. So consistently delivering every other week for four years uh, has given us a voice within the profession. I mean, our podcast is aimed at people in the profession or who are going to join the profession. So students who don't know what they're getting themselves into. I mean, that's one of our, our taglines at the beginning of the show. Like maybe you don't know what you're getting yourself into. So our job, I feel, is to lift the veil and show people behind the curtain what it's really like to work in architecture. What is, what is the good? What is the bad? What's the ugly? We're not here to hide anything and paint a pretty picture that it's not. But we're also passionate about what we do. And that passion has come across in the podcast, which has opened up the opportunities, which are going to AI national, you know, hopefully like creating credibility so that we can present a talk 
there and tell people how to do what we do. Like we are experts at this and I would love for there to be more architectural podcasts. Uh, we've been invited to Monterey Design Conference to cover that. Um, that's not a cheap conference to attend, yet we've been invited to go do that a few times now. Uh, we've been invited to speak at a structural engineering conference because we talked about the value of consultants. And uh, I mean, there's just been things like that. There's Those are kind of the big ones. There have been many other small ones. We've been reviewed on websites. We've been invited to participate on other podcasts. And if you think about it holistically, all of this makes my career more valuable. It, it makes what I have to offer people more valuable because of the wide range of experiences. But it also brings value to the firm that I work for because of the exposure that I have, because I've been willing to put myself out there and share my stories. And I think one of the one of the things that most people kind of would maybe struggle with when they think about doing this is the, the notion of imposter syndrome, which is like <laughs> people are going to figure me out and know that I'm, I'm not who I say I am. And that's really not the case. I mean, when you put yourself out there, you're being true and honest to where you are at that time. And there is, like I said, an evolution. There are things that I said in the early episodes of the podcast that no longer apply because of where I've changed in my profession. I mean, I'm licensed now, right? That I was not licensed when I started the podcast. I waited till later, later in life to do that. Um, and so my views have changed about things. And, and what's kind of cool about that is people get to go along that journey with us and they get to turn us in, turn us on every two weeks and listen to some friends talking about architecture. And I, I really enjoy that about it. Mm, fantastic. Any surprises from the audience that you've gotten just in terms of, you know, listener feedback or cool things people have said back to you? Has there any been any things that stick out in your mind in that regard? Well, what one thing you learn to deal with when you put yourself out there are the the haters and the trolls, right? I mean, there's definitely uh, those people who I, I I I give the analogy of road rage, right? If people are hiding inside behind their computer or inside their car like on the freeway, it's this protective outer shell, and I don't know where that comes from. I mean, so I I'm always surprised by by the the kind of feedback that you get that's negative and that is trying to bring you down or shut you up. Um, I don't, I don't know where that, because that, that's not natural for me to go out and do that. And so I, it's, it's always kind of one of those things where when I'm witnessing it aimed at me, uh, that's, that's kind of discouraging, but you learn to like deal with that and get through it. Um, we've well, got a lot of constructive maybe the, feedback. The, the, the Hurtful things or crazy things listeners have said to you? Um, well, I don't, I can think of one that was said to Neil was because Neil was a sole proprietor and he ended up shutting that business down and going back to, you know, work for the man. And, uh, and there was another architect who was extremely outspoken about how you're a sissy this. And I mean, using like, like, harsh language commenting on our website. I, you know, if more architects weren't like you, that'd be better. And, and, and we're just sharing our experiences. I mean, it gets to a point where you have to provide for your family. What are you going to do? And, and if you don't want to have your own firm anymore, you're going to go work somewhere else. And he just tore into Neil and, and it's like, wow, like this guy was on a, a crusade to, to bring Neil down. And it was, it was pretty crazy to go through that experience. I mean, it really did affect Neil. It affected us as supporters of Neil. Um, and so it was, it was one of those things where it was like, how do you deal with that all of a sudden? Like, do you just ignore it and move on? Or do you actually deal with it? I mean, it, it brings in a new dynamic and you don't want to feed it. I mean, you know, they say don't feed the trolls right uh, out there on the <laughs> internet, but it's hard not to, uh, stick up for yourself and fight back, right? So you kind of learn how to deal with those social dynamics when you're in a global communication platform where anybody can say whatever they want with no consequences. I mean, it's amazing to think of all the businesses out there who are at the mercy of Yelp reviews and Amazon reviews where there is no recourse as a business owner or as a product creator to go back in there sometimes and 
and fix what was wronged or a, a perceived wrong. Uh, mm-hmm. So in this digital age we live in, I think we're all kind of struggling with how to deal with things like that. It, that, it is hard. Uh, how did you guys deal with that? How did Neil deal with that from what you know? I, it was, he handled it a little more passively. And I think Cormac and I went on the offense and just said, we, we really stuck up for him and tried to explain things, but it, there was no getting through. And, and I guess it, what it ended up doing was made us in, in put in a clause on every single web page, which is, you know, be cool with your comments. And, you know, be constructive. I mean, we all went through architecture school. We learned what the critique was like and what it was for. And the idea of the critique is to make projects better. But a lot of jurors get that wrong. And they they basically use that platform as a way to tear somebody else down to make themselves look good. That's exactly what was happening here. And so we had to put in some new policies and, and basically say, be cool we'll, or we'll delete your stuff. And because that stuff... It, once it's on the internet, it's on the internet. You know, there, it's hard to get it back off. Uh, and so basically we just created an extra layer of protection. And it's not like we don't want to hear honest critique. We just don't want it to be not cool like that, where it's really trying to tear somebody down. What opportunities do you think there are there for other architects or designers to have a podcast? Why would they do that? I think there's so many that I haven't even thought of. Um, there's podcasting opportunities, like I was mentioning earlier, to tell your stories. There are so many cool stories that I get out of working with clients that I can share with clients, other potential clients, to say, this is what it's like to work on a project with me. I mean, it's easy enough to go to my website and see my photography or see my portfolio, but that doesn't tell the whole story, right? The story of architecture is in that design process when you are working with those people. I mean, when you get a client to to say something like, whoa, I never would have thought of that. That's why I hired you. And tell that story to other people. They want to feel that same thing. They want to say that same thing. They want to tell the story of their project to everybody who walks in the door. And so if we're creating those projects for people, if we're creating meaning for them, we should share that. And, and I think that's a great avenue to share because a lot of the architecture podcasts out there are internally focused on the profession of architecture. I think there's so much potential out there to share with the world, which is our target market, right? Everybody out there. Um, we want to do more work. We want to work for them. And I think there's huge opportunity in that. I mean, there's, it's fairly untapped. Yeah, I agree 100%. You talked about, at the beginning, you talked about the new book you just came out with. Uh, sounds fantastic. You talked about the fact that later in life, you went down the route, <clears throat> got registered. And so the ARE yep. is fresh on your mind, so to speak, relatively fresh. Yeah. I. It was one of those things that's kind of cathartic for me. It's like, I, I talk about it in the book. First, I wanted to finish what I started when I went to architecture school. I always had that nagging talk in the back of my mind saying, you know, finish what you started. Like you're not a real architect yet. Um, and I didn't have to become a real architect with the title, um, working at the firm that I do. I mean, it's just not something that is necessary, but again, creating opportunities for myself as an architect, I get to create more opportunities for myself in my career. Uh, I also wanted to silence that nagging voice in the back of my head. And so writing this book was something that I found no one else had done, which was share their experience. I mean, it's the same reason I do the podcast. I want to give people a leg up because I want this profession to be better. And so when I wrote this book, my audience is students who are graduating people who have been working in the profession like I had for 15 years before they even started. I mean, life got in the way. I've got four kids. I've got things every single day of the week, activities that I've got to do with them. I'm married. I have a house. I've got to pay for that mortgage. I've got to do the yard work. I've got to do all this stuff. And so how do you create the space in your life to actually make this happen? That is the hardest thing, right? Everybody knows what that's like who is in a situation similar to that. 
And so I came up with tips and tricks and strategies and trial and error to come up with a winning strategy where I was able to get my license, even though life is totally packed full. Um, and then I also wanted to give people an insight. What's it like to sit in a testing center? What are you in for? Uh, wh- is it hot? Is it cold? What's the computer system like? What's the check-in process? What's it like to fail an exam? What's it like to pass an exam? What should you do after you pass an exam? What's your next step? And so basically creating a whole plan, a whole strategy so that you can succeed at these exams. They are not easy. They are probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life because I waited so long to do it. Uh, and so I want to give people a, a leg up in that whole situation. So that's why I wrote the book. Most people, when they pass these exams, want to walk away and forget about it, right? It is one of those things that is so hard. It's like, okay, great, done. Check that off the list. Forget about it. I wanted to share the whole experience and and so that I could help people do it. And I feel like that was kind of what was missing from the options out there. So I, I put it into a book and I made something. You talked about, well, you've been doing this for a while. You've been an, an architect for a certain amount of time. Before that, you've worked in the field of architecture for a long time. However, you yep. said it was one of the hardest things you've done. I think people outside the profession would be surprised to hear that you yeah. worked inside the industry so long and yet the ARE was so hard. So what does yep. that say about the ARE and being an architect to you? I, you know, the ARE is, is a weird thing because there's so much secrecy surrounding what it is and what the content is and all that. I mean, one of my chapters in the book is I get up on my soapbox and I talk about how the way that it's given, where it's, it's very anonymous, right? I think which does a disservice to the profession. The way that it used to be given where hundreds of people would walk into a big room at the same time and I'll take it together. There was a camaraderie there that's missing. And so as standardized testing has become more popular, right, in school systems everywhere and for ARE and for x-ray technicians and tow truck drivers and and uh, exterminators, I mean, it, what's weird is you walk into a room taking an ARE and somebody sitting next to you is doing their MCATs and someone else is trying to become an x-ray technician and someone else is trying to do all those things that I just mentioned. And there's no camaraderie there. I mean, they don't, the people who check you in have no idea what the ARE even is. It's just one, one of the tests that they offer. And so I think part of my book is exposing that as a failing of NCARB. I wish that the ARE had more intention to make the profession better. Honestly, like sitting in these test centers as an architect it's like one of the worst spatial experiences I could have. It's a little tiny cubicle on a really crappy computer with 55 degree air blowing on my face as I freeze in the middle of summer taking an ARE for six hours in a test center. I mean, it's crazy that this is how architects get registered. Um, and so I think the general public has no clue right, about what, it, what it's like. Everybody knows that lawyers take the bar exam. Right. And they take it right after school. And we all know that doctors do their residency and then they take their their tests and then they become doctors. But architects, uh, there's no time limit. Right. There's no it depending on the firm you work for. There may be no incentive at all to become a licensed architect. And so uh, I think that's done a little bit of a disservice to us. And because there are so many unlicensed architects out there. Uh, it's created this whole opportunity. I mean, you, everybody knows you don't have to be licensed to do residential work, right? Or tenant improvement work. And so guess, guess who takes that business? Non-architects, right? Um, or people who are, don't have as much experience a lot of times, right? For the most part, who's the cheapest person to do this for me? Um, because there's not a value associated with that. So, they're, they're, the whole perception thing is a big problem, and and you know that's one of the things that I would like to change about this. And we, the one way that I do that is through the podcast. And how is it that someone like yourself, who's been doing the work that an architect would do for so long, can't just walk in there and just okay, boom, 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 I got it, I got this, you know, no problem. I've been doing this for a long time. Right. Maybe somebody can. It wasn't me though. <laughs> there are some people who say, "Oh, it's easy," and I'm like, "Good for you." Um, that's great that it's that it's easy for you, but I think the tests are not set up in any way to be easy at all. So, yeah, and they do not. 
architecture. So going back to the you don't know what you don't know, or like you said in your podcast, you say, you know, maybe you don't know what you're getting into kind of deal. There is so much variety within architecture. I'll bet you some of the things that are on that test, you've probably maybe never done them and you never will do them again. Never will. Yeah. I mean, that it's another important distinction to make is that, you know, the seven exams as, as it sits right now in ARE4, and it's going to be six exams in ARE5, it's, an, it's treating it as a national thing, right? But on the West Coast, where we are, we've got desert climate. We've got 16 climate zones, right, in California alone, right? But on the test, you're going to be asked about doing a building in Boston that has brick and how, how are you going to do your grout joints and how are you, and, and I may never work with brick in Southern California. I might, I might not. Personally, I haven't, right? And so we treat the exams as if it is a national thing, yet it's not a national license, right? It is state to state license. So then in California, we have to take the California supplemental, which is a whole other beast all unto itself. And so where does that leave candidates? I mean, that, that leaves everybody with, like you just said, like you may never, ever have to do a wetlands project, yet that is a part of the test, right? And so it's, it's not very focused. There, it, it's trying to cover all the bases, and then you get funneled into a very particular piece of practice. I mean, like my, my co-host, Neil, he does residential multifamily housing. That is the only project type he has ever done, ever. And he's been in the profession for almost 30 years. Uh, so, so yeah, I don't, I don't know how, how to fix the problem, but there's definitely a lot to talk about, I think, amongst architects. Fantastic. And when people go out, when they get your book, what are they going to discover? You're going to discover that you can do it. I mean, part of my my thing that I try to beat into people's heads is you have to choose yourself. No one else is going to do this for you. And I think it's easier than ever to put it off and to quit. And that, I mean, I talked about the problem with that. I mean, it's one of those things where you can show up for a test, you can walk out right in the middle of it because there's no pressure from anybody else to keep you there. So setting up support systems is important. Setting up a, uh, a daily ritual of showing up to study is important. And so there's a lot of people out there who are lead very busy lives. They're going to discover that they can do it. And all of the answers of how to do it are right inside that book. And so it's not a book about what to study. I mean, it, let's be very clear. This is not a study guide. This is a how to hack your life. It's called ARE hacks, how to hack your life so that you can pass the AREs. I mean, and that's really what we have to do. We have to hack our lives to create the space so that we have time to make it happen. I mean, time is the most fleeting resource we have. So how do you make the most of it? Evan, if people want to find out more about you, uh, what direction, where do you want to send them to get the book to find out more about what you're doing? Just head over to arehacks.com. Um, that goes straight to my website. I mean, that's also my personal website, uh, which is also evantroxel.com. They both go to the same place. Uh, and it'll tell you all about the book. I'm actually doing a giveaway this week. I don't know uh, when your podcast is going live, but check that site and see uh, if you can still get in on that. I'm giving away some copies of the book. And uh, that's where you can order it. There's links to the Amazon and the Kindle and the paperback and whatever. There's lots of options there. But that's got my personal blog as well. It's got my photography. It's got everything that I kind of put out into the world. That's my central hub. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. This has been a fun talk. And I hope that we get accepted at AIA National so that we can hang out again. I agree. And that is a wrap. Thank you for listening today. If you're looking for more time, freedom, impact, and income as an architect, get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. The sponsor for today's show is Arch Reach, the client relationship management tool built specifically for architects. If you want to systematize your marketing and business development, Arch Reach will help you do it. Visit archreach.com to learn more.
The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world.